Have you ever wondered what it was like to be in a community with Jesus? That's what we'll talk about today. A Christian fellowship lives and exists by intercession of its members for one another, or it collapses. I can no longer condemn or hate a brother for whom I pray, no matter how much trouble he caused me. His face, that hitherto may have been strange and intolerable to me, is transformed in intercession into the countenance of a brother for whom Christ died. The face is of a forgiven sinner. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, Life Together. There was a challenge that came in that talked a little bit to me about whether or not a quote or discussion of C.S. Lewis has to do with us as individuals versus us as a community. And as I looked into the conversation, the idea of community became a good topic. I wanted to talk a little bit about that. And I think I want to talk about it more in the future. I've been reading this book and it is a pretty lengthy book, but it gave me some viewpoints, a particular viewpoint on community and Christianity. And I've been reading a book about Dietrich Bonhoeffer. And the question came in my mind while I was reading this book about Bonhoeffer. If you don't know, he was an educated theologian, pastor in Germany before and during World War II, eventually was locked up and um, killed by Hitler's people. If you didn't know that Hitler really wanted to be the ruler of everything. He killed many pastors for not falling in line. Hitler was not a Christian, did not believe in Christian things, and did not tolerate Christ having a position over him. And so Dietrich Bonhoeffer did lose his life. Before that time, he wrote a number of books. One of them was Life Together, and that was talking about Christian community. But here's the thing that got me about Dietrich Bonhoeffer, is even short times before his arrest, he was in the United States, he was in London, and I thought, well, if you saw what was happening in Germany, why did you go back? What in the world caused you to go back to Germany when you could see what was happening? And I think it's a shortcoming of mine, to be honest, because... He had to go back. These were his people. This was his community, even his family. And he had to go back in order to pastor a group of people who needed it more than anything to help a nation that was hurting and to help people who were hurting. He had no choice but to go back. And in a sense, it's a selfishness of mine to even wonder well, why did you go back? Stay in London. People begged him, stay here. We will take care of you. We'll give you this job. You can have this job. Don't go back. And he did every time. And of course, he lost his life through that process. So in doing some of the research, I picked up a book called When the Church Was a Family, Recapturing Jesus' Vision for Authentic Christian Community by Joseph H. Hellerman. This book, I think, was a hard book to read, and it's kind of a long book, too. But I think it's meant particularly for church leaders to talk about how to have a more authentic church. But there are certainly places for us in this book as well, and what our role as parishioners should be towards each other. Now, I don't know that I agree with every point of his book, but I think overall, The book makes you think about what it is we should be. The reason I think I had such a struggle with this book is that he talked a lot about uh, collective living. And unfortunately, that has such huge political ramifications in my mind. But not only that, he's, I think, angry or disappointed in the American church and American evangelicals. And I happen to be an American evangelical. And I'm not saying, certainly, that we do everything right. And I'm also not saying that we do not have room to take on criticisms. Of course we do. But it just was, I think, came off a lot stronger than I probably would give it. I would bet you that someday when we go to heaven and we talk to God about 
this and that and, and how life was. Every society had pluses and minuses, pros and cons. You probably talked to some communities back in the time of the old temple and you say, well, you weren't harsh enough about worship of fake gods in your community. Or you allowed certain issues of Baal to leak out inside of your town. If we look at Germany, certainly there will be a lot of things said about Christians, good and bad. Those who stood up, like Cory Ten Boom and Dietrich Bonhoeffer, those who didn't stand up, you know, everything that comes to it. And the American church is certainly going to be no different when it comes to how we're doing. We, of course, have that ideal of American individualism. We believe in individualism as this whole in this country. And where he takes a lot of anger at it is when we talk about fixing ourselves, finding our life's meaning, deciding what we're going to be when we grow up or get out of college and who we're going to marry and what we're going to become and where we're going to live. And it's true. We rarely take God into consideration when making those decisions. I think when we're thinking about getting married, a lot of us take God into the consideration of, is this the kind of person God would want me to marry? I thought a lot about that when I was dating. Would God want me to date a person like this? What would would he think if I got married to a person like this? So that was a big thing because I believe that marriage is a sacrament. And so it was important. But when it came to what job I picked or what house I picked or what town I lived in, it's not true at all that I ever considered what I thought God might want in this situation or what even my community needed. You know, I live in a place that is rough when it comes to Christianity. It hates religion in general where I live and in particular Christianity. I remember how it fought so hard against our church having a Bible passage on the outside of our building. What if someone looked up and saw it? (laughs) What would they think? And so it never struck me that living here, and I don't particularly like living here, maybe is my calling. Maybe if all of us in the church escape the places we don't want to live with our individualism, There will be no one to be witnesses to the people who are in this town. So we should take into consideration exactly what it is. The other part that he gives as a problem with the American church is that we're very quick to leave. That we're like, well, this person ticked me off. I'm angry at them. I'm just going to go find another church. That he says we have what's called spiritual wonderlust, where we just go from church to church looking for a congregation we'll like and looking for people that we like, and we don't put down roots. We don't know any of our church parishioners. We don't know any of the people who are part of it. We go to church on Sunday, we do our part, and then we're done. And I get it. I think, you know, he has an absolute point when it comes to our society that we're shallow, that in in our community. And I'm a perfect example of it. I am not a big community person. I have a very small community of people I trust implicitly. And yes, they're Christians and we pray for each other. We talk about our fears. And so I think we are that community belief with each other. We help each other financially. We help each other when we need help. And so we have that with each other. But as a church as a whole, probably not. I got kind of disappointed, I guess, during the pandemic because I don't belong to that big of a church. However, no one ever contacted us to say, hey, are you all right? Or how are you doing? Gee, Jill, I know that you live by yourself. Is it hard for you? Are you really lonely? Would you like to have a Zoom call and have a prayer session about it? And to my mind, a pandemic was that perfect place where a church could really show through. I even visited a church once, and the fact of it is I signed up to visit the church once, and then I ended up not going because I had something else I had to do. But you know what? Every week they sent me an email, they offered counseling sessions, 
They are, and I know it was an automatic script. It's an automatic email system. They sent it to 8,000 people. I get that. But someone thought to do it. In some ways, I found more kinship with this church that I had never been to because they sent me emails, a robot or an AI send me emails to check in on me. But somebody thought of it. But then I thought, too, isn't the problem my own making? Because I didn't contact people in the church to see how they were doing. I didn't contact to see how my pastor was doing. And so that goes both ways. I could be disappointed in the church because I do think a pandemic is a great place for a church to really reach out and see if everyone's doing okay. But it's also a really great place for a parishioner, a brother and sister in Christ to reach out and find out how that everyone else is doing too. So the fault is my own as well. He also talks about how, you know, the American family is, is so important and that we worry about what house we have and what our kids are up to and what schools are going to. And I struggle to see that as a bad thing, thing, but that we're so wrapped up in our own family and our own kids getting into college. The reason he finds it difficult is because we're not putting the right groups into the right order. That not only do we have this individualism, we have this familyism, and that we're all wrapped up into our individual families and how they're doing. And he thinks that's not really how Jesus saw the church or thought how we should have relationships with each other. He also says that we may be surprised that the idea of a personal savior is not anywhere in the Bible. And I never thought of that it was. I do believe that we are individually saved. And I think that's personally clear, that God asks each one of us to come to him, to confess our sins, to believe in him, and that we are not saved as a community. And I don't think he's saying that either. But the first step in believing in Jesus is a personal step, I think. And so saying a personal savior rubs him the wrong way because the Savior is a Savior of all of us, not a Savior of me. But I don't think either bad things about it if I think about Jesus saving me. I don't think it also makes me believe that he didn't save you or doesn't save the community around us. And so maybe I'm overreading what he's talking about, but he calls it an overemphasis on our personal relationship with God in America, and that he believes it's not a biblical thing. He says that a lot of times when we look at even Paul's writing, that when Paul talks about Jesus, it's our Lord, that only one time he says, my Lord, but 53 times he says, our Lord. And that speaks, he says, to the priorities of Paul, that he was a God of all of us. And I think Paul in particular, and he does go into more detail, we'll talk about it, was writing to communities. You know, the reason Paul, I think, is different than most of the other apostles is that we see Paul in his letters, and he is trying to get the church to get away from pettiness, to get away from sin, to get away from the challenges of their society or the culture around them, he is being a counselor to groups of people. In that particular era, when you're talking about the time of Jesus, what you often had is you had a rabbi, and a rabbi usually had a group of students that the rabbi would teach, they would educate, they'd go to the rabbi for help, for advice, and they'd work together. And I think that that is exactly what you see with Jesus. Jesus calls the 12 to be his apostles, to be his representatives. And he counseled them and he coached them and he worked with them very closely. But then he also reached out to other people. He fed the thousands of people who would listen to him as he would tell them what the kingdom of God was like, what salvation was like, what the important aspects of God were about. But he never lost sight of his apostles. At the same time, he didn't lose sight of the people who were in the community 
like Mary Magdalene, who wasn't an apostle, but was close to him and close to his community. So I think that Paul, too, represents that because Paul, you saw, had Timothy. He wrote these letters to the various churches. And so he saw this as a community of believers inside this Roman Empire. And they all had different challenges because some of the Roman Empire was in Italy and some of the Roman Empire was in Greece. And he just feels in this book, he just talks about it, that this success mentality we have in the United States is so vapid and that we try to meet our needs through self-help books. And I have a personal productivity podcast. I try to help people make their lives better, too. But he finds it all very shallow and vapid because where we go is to Christ. We don't go to self-help books. We don't try to improve just our family. We need to start looking at our church and our community of believers as our family that is the primary family, that it's the most important part of it, that when the apostles came, They oftentimes left their family behind. Jesus often talked about his new family as being these people. Think about Peter. Peter was married. Where is Peter's wife? He left his wife. He left his parents behind, left his business behind, and followed Jesus because his new family was this tight group of believers that served Jesus. And that's the model he's talking about. This new family is the church and our brothers and sisters in Christ. He said that we have to look at ourselves as with that sense of belonging that we have towards each other. He talks about kind of the culture of what the family of Jesus was like and how it was very much a Middle Eastern family of the time. That first of all, brothers were the tightest relationship in all of the families in the Middle East at this time, that family was more important than anything. As you can tell, you know, even like uh, material goods, farms and, and businesses went through to families. He even talks about how you didn't really have much of a choice. If you were the child of a carpenter, like Jesus was, you're going to become a carpenter. That's, your, that's what you're going to do. You're not going to become a Roman centurion. And if you do those things, it's looked at poorly. I mean, I think a lot of times, look at Matthew. Matthew comes from a Jewish family. They had a house in a good location, so they probably had some money. And he could have followed in whatever footsteps Matthew's family was involved in. But instead, he went off on his own and became a tax collector for the Romans. I mean, that's not how this goes. And he picked wrongly. But in America, our choices about what I want to do, where I want to go. And to a lot of extent, I think it's a good thing. I don't think he thinks it's a good thing, but I think it's a good thing because my dad was a pig farmer. I am a terrible gardener. I would make a terrible farmer. I think what I'm doing now fits my skills that I think God gave me this ability to do technology. So am I wrong because I didn't follow in my family's footsteps? Am I wrong because I didn't follow and do what my mother did? I I don't think that's true. I think that there's advantages in the way our society works in America, that we are able to find the things that we're good at and find the strengths that God gave us and use them for good. And I think that having us have this relationship with Jesus in our way is also really good. I've read a lot about different people like Augustine and John Calvin and other people and their relationships with God. And the one that touched me the most was the way Luther thought of God. When Luther prayed to God, he was praying as if Jesus was walking next to him and he was talking to a friend. I love that. So is it wrong that I picked a church community? that fit me, you know, and had I been baptized initially into a church that didn't fit me and I went off and looked for a church that did, is that wrong in a sense because I didn't stick with my community? 
Not sure what he thinks about that. But he said that God is concerned that we have a community, that we're a part of a community, and that Christianity in no way is meant to be alone. And so even the way I go about it, like I said, I'm terrible about community. And I think in the end what this book helped me do is think I need to establish a better belief in being in a part of a community that it's more important that I give credit for. And my lack of community and my lack of participation in a community is harmful. So I think that that part of the book really struck me as important. But in ancient Israel, at the time of the Bible, families were important. You even saw John the Baptist was a cousin of Jesus, and Jesus had brothers and sisters that were his brothers and sisters from his family and brothers and sisters who were not a part of his family. That relationship, that kinship was a big part of it, that they took family very seriously. But here's where Jesus was different. Jesus said, here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does the will of God is my brother and sister and mother. He even said the children should come to him, also children. That is the family of Christ. Peter was his family, even though they weren't related. John the Baptist was his family, and they were related. So they shared everything. They shared houses. They shared food. They pooled their money together in order to help each other, to help the poor people around them. They used this idea of a Jewish family, but now extending them to whoever serves God. And even Jesus used strong language about family, that if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother, wife and children, brother and sister, and yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. And that means, I think, what they call the dying of the self, that we have to give up, not our mothers and our fathers and our sisters and our brothers, but we have to give up that unbreakable chain with them because the unbreakable chain is with Jesus. God is our top priority always. And so if we're not willing to give him that top place in our lives, we're not following him. Well, he said our first priority should be God's family. The second should be my family. And then the third should be other people. And that that comes into another point that I think is interesting too is that I absolutely believe that God should be first. Then we can talk about God's family, my family, and then other people. You know, I think that's not necessarily wrong, but certainly Jesus has to be first. I know he wants us to break away of that idea, that individual relationship with Jesus, but I believe we have an individual relationship with Jesus, and that does have to come first. Uh, Quote, millions were genuinely converted And, for better or worse, Christianity became the state religion of the empire. This is where I kind of feel that I think he's saying the right things. I think he's just being too strong about it, or maybe saying it in a way that rubs me the wrong way. Millions were genuinely converted for better or for worse. I don't believe that you can convert people for worse. I think when people come to Jesus, follow Jesus confess their sins, and become a part of the church body, that's always for better. And so I understand that his point is in the end, when it became a state religion, that was for worse. But those individuals who came to Christ genuinely, it can't be for worse. It is always for the best that people come to Jesus. And so I wonder if he even feels that if you are someone who comes to Jesus but does not enter a community together, maybe it's all worthless. And it can't be worthless because our relationship, our salvation, our going to heaven is important. We have to take care of that, I think, first. If I saw you dying on the road and I knew you weren't going to make it, course, I'm going to spend time with you talking to you about Jesus. 
When Jesus saw the criminal on the cross, he didn't ask the criminal to think about which community he belonged in. He says, you'll be with me because you believe in me, right? That criminal was going to be in heaven with him. And that was the important part of it. So in my mind, I understand this really rubs him the wrong way, but I still think that a person genuinely becoming a Christian, believing in Christ, confessing their sins, of course, is the most important thing. But the part we forget, and this is where I agree with him, is becoming part of a community. Jesus did not mean for us to be off on our own. He meant us to be a part of a church, to be a part of a community. And I agree. I think he's right about that. So my challenge to you is think of a way that some of the decisions you have before you could be made better if you started considering brothers and sisters in Christ. Is there a way that you can benefit the community of believers by the choices that you're making? Everyone, thanks so much. I appreciate you listening. Please remember that you can email me at jill at smallstepswithgod.com. I'd love to hear what your thoughts on this podcast are. I tried to make it as a challenge for us to stop thinking so much about our individualism and start thinking about all of us together as a community. Hope that helped (laughs) spring some ideas from you. So if you have thoughts on it, please feel free to email me. And just remember... Our walk as a community brings us together by using small steps. Mm -hmm.